All right, hey there. I'm back with some more news, Barino. And if you've been following gaming news for the last two to three weeks, uh, you likely would have seen that the state of California is suing ActaBliz after a two-year investigation into rampant sexual harassment and toxic workplace culture. And before we get into the article, I want to state very clearly that the type of findings from this investigation, as well as all of the testimonials that have come out from current and ex-employees, uh, really paint a terrible picture that is wholly inappropriate and unacceptable to me. And I've waited a while to make a news burrito here because I knew that there would be just a plethora of new things coming out. Uh, and I wanted to wait until maybe we got something that wrapped all that information into one, one piece rather than doing it piecemeal. So this is a piece by Jason, Jason Schreier of Bloomberg, again, similar to my first news burrito where we talked about the Warcraft 3 Reforged uh, postmortem. Blizzard turned game developers into rock stars. Misbehavior followed. Managers set the tone by hiring mostly men, stoking their egos, and dating women in the company, current and former employees said. Now, also before we start, I want to make clear, I think it's important that people understand the difference between journalism versus like an op-ed, right? Journalism does require corroboration. It's not just making baseless claims or taking one person's testimonial as fact. Uh, I'd encourage you to, to maybe read into that if you are skeptical of, of different pieces. You know, look into, uh, you know, who writes them, what their title is, what their goal is, etc., etc. Media Literacy. One summer day in 2018, employees of the video game maker Blizzard Entertainment opened their email to find a brusque message from the chief executive officer, Mike Morheim. It said the company parted ways with Ben Kilgore, the chief technology officer, and Morheim's heir apparent. The email didn't give a reason, but employees immediately began to gossip. Kilgore presided over the most notorious group of sexist drinkers at the Irvine, California headquarters, where sexism and drinking were rampant, current and former employees said. Shortly afterwards, they got a supposed explanation during a large staff meeting. Derek Ingalls, now head of the technology department, was asked why his former boss had left. Ingalls told a brief story that concluded with a strange piece of advice. Don't sleep with your assistant, but if you're going to sleep with your assistant, don't stop. I almost feel like just that one quote uh, is so reflective of everything we've heard uh, coming out of Blizzard recently and the culture there. It's, it's very inappropriate. Five people who attended the meeting, which hasn't been previously reported, recounted versions of that story in interviews with Bloomberg. Also in the room that day was a representative from Human Resources who stood silently by, they said. Engel's comment led to a barrage of speculation surrounding Kilgore's departure that Bloomberg had not been able to verify. Regardless, a former Blizzard assistant said this sort of locker room banter was sexist and damaging to the careers of assistants and other women at the company. And I feel like it's pretty elementary to understand why that is the case. The comment illustrates a side of Blizzard unknown to the outside world until recently. The games it developed, such as Diablo and Warcraft, are among the most critically acclaimed on the market. The Activision Blizzard Inc. division was regularly ranked among the best places to work, and served as a shining example of how to build a long-running game studio that never put out a bad product. Well, that's debatable, but sales, I suppose, should, you know, prove that in a way. That facade crumbled last month when California sued Activision Blizzard, saying it harbored a frat boy culture of sexual harassment and discrimination. Current and former Blizzard employees then took to social media to share their own experiences. More than 50 spoke to Bloomberg, and most requested anonymity over fear of reprisal. Women recalled getting accosted for dates at the office, being subjected to alcohol-fueled hazing rituals, and watching male colleagues use company events as a venue to solicit sex. Six women said they reported incidents to Blizzard's HR department and saw no results. Their stories provide insight into how the culprit culture developed into a legal liability. The complaint from California and the employee protests and shareholder lawsuit that soon followed spurred the company to action. Activision Blizzard Chief Executive Officer Bobby Kotick apologized, and the company ousted Blizzard's president and an HR executive. So that's talking about J. Allen Brack, who resigned, and also the top HR executive, I believe, in the Blizzard side of things. And this was this was some of the most recent news uh, of them stepping down. And I want to be clear that you don't have to partake in these malicious harassment, acts of harassment, or partake in the, you know, the drinking, the day drinking and going around and, um, you know, insulting your fellow employees with hazing rituals, etc., etc. You don't have to partake in those in order to uphold an institutional culture that allows it to continue happening. So I do think that 
it's good that Jay Allen Brack has resigned because if you're the CEO of a company, it's important that you get out quality products and return to your shareholders, but you also set the culture of your company and you have to you have to be aware of what's going on and you have to enforce your code of conduct. In an emailed statement, an Activision Blizzard spokesman said, We appreciate the courage of any current or former employee who felt uncomfortable in the workplace in coming forward with fully, and we will fully investigate any such claims. Morheim, the Blizzard co-finder and former CEO, declined to comment. Kilgore and Ingalls didn't respond to multiple requests for comment about the meeting in 2018. Ingalls left the following year for a job at Amazon.com, Inc. Although California's case is against the parent company, a global game publisher with nearly 10,000 employees, the bulk of the complaint centers on Blizzard. Until just a few years ago, the unit operated with near autonomy, largely because its quirky formula was so successful. Its fantasy and science fiction worlds borrow heavily from tent poles of nerddom, like the Lord of the Rings and Alien. Blizzard has cultivated such an adoring fan base that it draws tens of thousands of people to an annual convention where its attendees cosplay as characters from the games and the developers are treated like rock stars. I've been to BlizzCon, I've been to one BlizzCon, and it is true, there's an air of self-importance to it. A lot of games get made, and they don't have conventions about them. It's absolutely a rock star mentality, and it touched almost every aspect of Blizzard culture, said Christina McConan, who worked at the company from 2013 to 2019. And that's a pretty long tenure for a tech company. Six years at the same place. These developers were untouchable. Not only could they tell you how to do your job, but they had so much power, they could do whatever they want in line of sight with their other powerful friends. Blizzard management set the tone by hiring mostly men, stoking their egos and offer often overlooking or being unaware of misbehavior, current and former employees said. Many executives were also dating lower-ranked employees. Morheim, who ran the company for 27 years, courted and then married a Blizzard business director in 2010. Another founder, Frank Pierce, left his wife for a Blizzard customer service representative, and they wedded in 2012. J. Allen Brack, the outgoing president, also married a lower-level employee. Now, I want to point out my opinion is it's not inherently bad to have workplace relationships, but what this shows is a pattern of high-level executives who have distinct power dynamics over lower-level employees. Um, kind of, again, setting an implicit tone. It's not necessarily malicious, but it does the outcome. Um, you know, the, the way that it happens is not malicious, but the outcome... Uh, can have negative results. It sets it, again, it can contribute to a negative atmosphere. Those relationships were consensual, but they set a precedent that made some female employees uncomfortable, the women said. That dynamic combined with testosterone-fueled arrogance and heavy drinking that were a regular part of office culture led to frequent and often unwanted sexual advances. Cher Scarlett, who worked at Blizzard for a year starting in 2015, said she was groped by male co-workers at two company parties. It didn't even occur to me I should report this behavior, she said, because in my mind, this behavior was normal and protected here. And this is what I mean when I talk about an institutionalized culture. It's something that's ingrained that you don't necessarily have to participate in to uphold. Blizzard was founded in 1991 by three men. Early employees, almost exclusively male, were bookish and introverted. Those days were less a drunken party and more like the inside of a teenage boy's bedroom. Desks were adorned with pictures of scantily clad women, and designers drew characters with large breasts and little clothing, recalled one of the few women there at the time. A video created for the company's 10th anniversary condescendingly describes the easy laugh and sister-like qualities of Blizzard's first female employee. Uh, I've seen this 10th anniversary video, and I actually brought it up in the first news burrito where we were talking about Warcraft 3 when I was talking about Crunch and how... Um, there were employees that were interviewed for that where they were talking about having to get a second and third job, um, which is not something to take pride in, but they almost seemed like prideful of the amount that they were overworked. However, the team quickly became known for making quality games. Its biggest innovation was Battle.net, an online platform that made it easy to match against other players on the internet. It served as the basis for Blizzard's success moving forward. In 2004, Blizzard began to penetrate pop culture with World of Warcraft. The online game set in a vast land of orcs and elves had more than 10 million subscribers by 2008. That summer, Activision finalized a merger with Vivendi Games, the parent of Blizzard, generating a windfall for early employees. Now, I want to talk about this briefly because a, a common response that I've seen to this whole scandal is people conflating it with the Activision merger. Now, I'm glad that this paragraph here was pointed out because this type of ingrained culture in a workplace doesn't just pop out of nowhere in like a year or two. Um, Activision started getting way more involved in Blizzard's management and operations in 2018. So people are, are maybe saying, oh, you know, Blizzard's 
titles have been going downhill. I'm not happy with the current titles. Um, so they almost use this real issue of of uh, harassment and toxic workplace culture and mistreatment of workers to sort of just be mad at their unhappiness with the, the games. Um, this is a separate issue, right? Blizzard um, getting micromanaged by Activision recently is a problem as it regards the quality of games. That's fine, but it is not necessarily uh, correlated uh, very strongly, at least. I think there's a little overlap um, with the, the workplace culture thing. I think the workplace culture thing existed before J. Allen Brack. I think it existed... Um, it's, it's something that was probably there the whole time. Uh, that's a speculation, but I just want to be clear. I think a lot of people are making baseless claims saying that this is all Activision's fault. And I think that, again, that is a separate issue. There's probably some mild overlap, but, I you know, I think there's two groups of people. Uh, the people who um, care about the quality of games, and they don't really care so much about this workplace stuff, but they use it to sort of as like a vehicle to, to, to be mad at Blizzard. And then you have people who care pretty much exclusively about the workplace problems and not so much about the games. I consider myself in the second group, you know, it, and if you're in the first group, that's fine. Um, I think it's important to be upset for the right reasons, I suppose. But, you know, the outcome is the same, which is um, properly directed outrage. All right, let's continue. Christine Brownell, who worked at Blizzard from 2003 to 2005, said she was never harassed, but noticed a change in a portion of her colleagues once World of Warcraft took off. Some got profit-sharing bonuses the size of their salaries, she said, and fancy cars suddenly populated the parking lot. Their ego filled the room, Brownell said. They thought so much of themselves and what they had done. And they earned that, but you have to be mindful of how you act and how it affects the workplace. This is, again, very elementary stuff. Buy your car, you earned it. But don't be an asshole. <laughs> World of Warcraft went on to become a cultural phenomenon. Vin Diesel and Mila Kunis confessed on talk shows that they were addicted. South Park devoted an episode to the game, and Universal Pictures released a big-budget movie, which is 28% on Rotten Tomatoes. Shock shocking that a video game movie sucks, because they all do. The, video, the, the company's convention, BlizzCon, ballooned from 4,000 attendees in 2005 to more than 20,000 in 2010. The events featured performances from Ozzy Osbourne and the Foo Fighters. And you can see one very consistent demographic in this picture. Uh, obviously, it's only one picture of BlizzCon, but very heavily the same type of person attends this. This marked a turning point for Blizzard and for its culture. Some male employees began to see, began to see women at the conventions, not just as customers, but as groupies. One woman who worked there recalled a, a conversation in which one of the Blizzard's top executives told a group of his staff that young women, both fans and colleagues, saw them as superstars. And why shouldn't they benefit sexually from that? Uh, because it's gross. They had these legions of fans swarming around them just because they are known figureheads in the community. And they're abusing their power like that to take advantage of these fans and their co-workers, said McConnell, a former Blizzard community manager. Female employees learned to avoid the bar at the Hilton Hotel near the convention center, which was a destination for drunk colleagues to hit on women, said McConnell and other former staff. The California lawsuit claimed a former Blizzard game director, Alex Afrasiabi, harassed women in a hotel room he and his colleagues referred to as the Cosby Suite. The nickname referred to how the carpet in the room resembled Cosby sweaters, former employees said, and predated the widespread public resurfacing of the sexual assault allegations against the comedian. Let me comment on this also. I can only speak about the U.S., but this company is based in the U.S. Um, it, it was like 2010, 2012. It was like, it, it, it was like 10 years ago that Bill Cosby became synonymous with sexual misconduct. Everybody knew that. It was, a, it was just like a cultural thing. People knew. Like, so let's be really charitable. When they say that the nickname for the room referred to the sweaters... I think that's bullshit, but let's be hypothetically charitable and say, okay, let's say they actually did name it because of the sweaters. And it did predate the sexual allegations, even though sexual, alle sexual misconduct allegations against Bill Cosby go back way before any of this. Um, as soon as Bill Cosby became culturally synonymous with sexual misconduct, you'd think that they would stop referring it to the Cosby room because... No matter what the intention was when they started calling it that, and again, we're being very charitable, um, it's still incredibly alienating 
to refer to anything as the Cosby Suite or the Cosby anything when Cosby is, again, synonymous with sexual misconduct. And the fact that they didn't even think that, oh, it's just the sweaters, and they'll understand, and not realizing how alienating it could be for women, or anybody, honestly, uh, is, is wrong. So the excuse doesn't matter, even though I think the excuse is bullshit regardless. Let's continue. They will wrangle up the cosplayers or the girls or whoever they see at BlizzCon, said McConnell. Occasionally, the company would discourage this kind of behavior, she said. This is when emails go out. Don't wrangle the fans into the executive suite. The, the fact that there were emails going up about this at all is incredibly indicative of the type of culture that was going on there, showing that everybody knew that this was happening. And instead of cracking down and ensuring it didn't happen, they just had to send out warning emails. Inside the office, women were outnumbered 4 to 1, according to an internal gender breakdown from 2017. That imbalance left women facing misogyny, loneliness, and harassment, current and former employees said. The Activision Blizzard spokesman said such conduct is abhorrent and will not be tolerated. And of course that's what the spokesperson's gonna say. Uh, but can I say, all this kind of stuff's always in your company handbook, where it says, hey, don't harass people in the workplace. And you think, of course. Um, but unless there's actual enforcement of that, and top-down leadership to show that it's not acceptable and that we have an inclusive work environment and everybody is expected to do their best so that we can create the best products, etc., etc. Um, you know, you can put that in your company handbook all you want. And you can say, you're supposed to say, oh, we don't tolerate this, but it's still happening. Men at all levels traded insults that regularly involved the word rape, according to the lawsuit and interviews. Some women found themselves so isolated that they were even at odds with female co-workers, said Nikki Broderick, who worked at Blizzard from 2012 to 2019. Because there were so few women, the women really had to compete to stand out with their peers, she said. It created a really toxic, competitive environment, not just between the men and the women at Blizzard, but the women themselves. Whenever a woman started in the quality assurance department, men would line up to introduce themselves, said two women who worked on the team. Male recruits did not get their own receiving lines. On the esports team, women frequently complained about a man who gave them unwanted back rubs, made inappropriate moaning noises during meetings, and discussed his sexual exploits in detail, said Broderick, a former project manager in the department. In spite of all the complaints, they didn't touch him, she said. Another colleague once told Broderick that her ass looks great in the shorts she was wearing. My friend reported it to HR, but nothing happened, Broderick said. I never wore shorts to the office again. And I'd also like to point out... Um, the fact that this person said that their friend reported it. And this is, again, it's about power dynamics and intimidation. You don't feel comfortable reporting something. Um, so Blizzard, Activision Blizzard can say, oh, we invent, we're going to investigate this ourselves and we're going to make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, but the fact is you have, you have a climate where your employees who are victimized don't feel comfortable working with you to resolve it in the first place because it's institutionalized. It's, it's deeply ingrained. Until his departure in 2018, Morheim was the heart, and often face a blizzard. He is soft-spoken, gregarious, and adored by many blizzard employees. Receptionists shared stories of Morheim's kindness, and developers gushed about how he prized creativity above all else. Glassdoor Reviews named him one of the top CEOs of 2018. Morheim encouraged people to come to him directly with their problems. And I talked about this a little bit in the first news barino, which is Morheim was, was liked by employees in the company for the most part because he cared about his games. He would purposefully delay games because he cared about the IP. It, was, it wasn't just only the bottom line. You know, he knew they had to make money, but he wanted to make the best games possible. I think the, the opposite side of that coin, though, is when you're CEO, you also have, you're in charge of the company, right? You're returning to your shareholder, shareholders, you're making the best product possible, but you, you're responsible for your workplace. The buck stops with you. You're the top of that chain. So if HR is shielding you or, or you knew about it, but you just sort of ignored it and hoped it would go away, you know, you can be a great leader in some aspects, but not in others. And it seems like Morheim failed in this in this specific way. People who worked for Morheim said his warm leadership style could be a blind spot. It's like I, I didn't read this article prior. Uh, so it's funny that this is basically what I was just talking about. Some said he was shielded from the misbehavior that he gave offenders the benefit of the doubt, extended to them too many chances or let them walk over him. In a private Facebook post reviewed by Bloomberg, a former assistant to Morheim wrote that she had informed him and other executives about rampant misconduct. In a public statement following the lawsuit, Morheim apologized to his former female employees and said he wanted to hear their stories. The fact that so many women were mistreated and were not supported means we let them down, he wrote. 
Many of the most grotesque descriptions of misconduct in California's lawsuit were about Blizzard's technology department, current and former employees said. Kilgore, the longtime head of the group, was Morheim's planned successor but didn't share his boss's understated demeanor. Two former employees said that they saw Kilgore touch female employees and colleagues inappropriately at work functions. The legal complaint described claims of Kilgore's misbehavior, identifying him only by his job title. Technology staff sometimes got drunk during work hours or showed up hungover. They vomited in trash cans and held after-work hazing rituals, where new recruits were expected to take shots of liquor every half hour, former employees recalled. Finally, in 2019, Blizzard enacted a two-drink maximum after, at after-work functions to stave off some of the problems and cut down on drunk driving. Again, you, if, you're, if you have to send emails out about this, there is a big problem, right? If it's an after-work function, in theory, people can do what they want. But if, if HR or whomever had to actually, like, send out warnings about this, they weren't addressing the core of the problem. The Me Too movement arrived late to the video games business, but it had a profound impact over the last year. Tencent Holdings Riot Games is facing two high-profile lawsuits, and Ubisoft Entertainment ousted three senior executives in a far-reaching scandal last year. Side note, Ubisoft as a company got off way too easy by firing those three people. The... The things detailed in the Ubisoft issue uh, were terrible, and I am shocked at how little consequences there have been. Riot has said company commission said a company commission investigation found that its CEO didn't sexually har harass or discriminate. Ubisoft has acknowledged its issues and vowed to make major changes. Um, the Riot one where it says a company commission investigation found that its CEO didn't sex sexually harass or discriminate is basically saying we investigated ourselves and we found no wrongdoing. That's what that means reading between the lines. Like, of course, you investigated yourself and you're going to say that nothing bad happened. The Blizzard name for decades was associated with quality. Morheim gleefully pushed back game deadlines, repeatedly frustrating investors, but inevitably producing hit after hit, which continued over the last decade with Hearthstone and Overwatch. Working there was a dream job embodied in the employee line, Bleed Blizzard Blue. It was common for game developers to make sacrifices just to get there. When you're someone who works at a company like Blizzard, it's almost like you ignore everything that's happening because you want to be there so badly, said Scarlet, the former employee. You stop seeing things that are bad as bad. Many former Blizzard staff said they took pay cuts in exchange for the prestige. Some sardonically referred to it as the Blizzard tax. One woman said that to save money, her lunch sometimes consisted only of Nestle hot chocolate packets. This boiled over a year ago when Bloomberg reported on, a, on an employee uprising and a letter to Blizzard president seeking better pay. None of their requests were addressed, employees said. Uh, again, I'll go on a bit of a tangent on this, which is... There's never a shortage of bright-eyed graduates who think that game development is some beautiful, romanticized thing, especially at Blizzard. And this shifts the equilibrium of supply and demand in the labor market. If you're a hiring manager at Blizzard, and you work in HR, and you're deciding how much you should be paying people that are coming on board, and you say, well, we've got 3,000 candidates for one role, why do we have to pay them so much? We don't have to pay them very much. If they don't want it, the next person will take it. And that's the sad, I mean, that's sad supply and demand. But part of the issue is an educational problem with candidates who, who again, they romanticize what game development is. Games are entertainment. Games are fun. Games are art. Games are toys. Whatever you, you know, the issue is it's just, it's an industry. It's a product. You consume it. It's not, I don't know. I, I don't want to get too far off the, the beaten path here. But basically, I think that there are far too many um, comp sci graduates who think that game development is somehow the path to their like self-actualization when in, they're going to be sorely disappointed when they're stuck working on like a Saturday and Sunday to meet a deadline that's dictated to them. It's you're, you're compared to other tech subsectors, you're underpaid and overworked. That doesn't mean that nobody should go into game development. I think it can be incredibly fulfilling. But I do think that it's overly romanticized. It's probably the most concise way I can put it. The salary gap was even more pronounced for women, according to interviews and the legal complaint. Seven women who worked at Blizzard said they made less than male colleagues with similar, similar experience. Two women said that they were told by their manager not to discuss their salaries. One shared screenshots of her boss saying salary information should be kept confidential, an apparent violation of California law. I'm sorry that I'm going on a lot of tangents, but I'm hopeful that this is a learning experience for some folks. Um... When it comes to discussing salary, 
The reason your employer doesn't want you to do that is because as soon as you know what the person next to you is making, if they have similar experience to you, if they got a similar performance review to you, if they're doing the same kind of work as you and you find out they're making more than you, then you're going to go back to your employer and say, I need more money. They don't want you to be competitive about your salary and they don't want you, have, they don't want you asking for more. So that's why employers try to make it taboo to talk about your salary. And you think, oh, it's awkward. I don't want to make someone feel bad because I'm making more than them. Or I don't want to feel bad because I find out I'm making less than someone. But the reality is, if you know that, you have way more power to negotiate your own salary. Activision Blizzard said it strives to pay all employees equitably for equal work and that it has higher promotion rates for women than men. The company doubled the number of women in game development leadership roles since 2016, the spokesman said. And that's that's nice. Again, it's like on paper, that's great. Uh, it doesn't seem like it was actually addressing any of the, the, the core ingrained problems. Nazi Fares, who worked at the company's Netherlands office from 2018 until this year, said the gender pay disparity was a point of contention for Blizzard employees around the globe. Lots of my colleagues were really annoyed, he said. Still, many women said they were willing to put up with the problems at Blizzard because they love the products, many of their co-workers, and even some aspects of the company's culture. But in the last four years, that competence was shaken. With Blizzard revenue sliding, Kotick and his deputies have taken a more active role in Blizzard's operations, Bloomberg reported last month. The incursion intensified after Morheim's exit in 2018. We talked about this in the last News Burino. And this is that overlap. Remember I said I think there's the Activision micromanagement in terms of game quality, and then there's Blizzard workplace garbage. And this is probably where that overlap. The the Again, if it's a Venn diagram, this is the slight overlap. But they are not two completely similar problems. Where were we? Current and recently departed employees said that rather than eliminate the sexist culture, the added oversight has only exacerbated Blizzard's problems. Activision has pushed Blizzard's staff to hit unrealistic deadlines and do more work with fewer resources, increasing stress and overtime across all levels. So here comes the crunch. A byproduct of these changes was the release last year of Blizzard's first bad game, Warcraft III Reforged. It was the result of mismanagement and financial pressures from Activision, according to people who worked on the game. Developers on the project wrote in an internal postmortem reviewed by Bloomberg that they were suffering from exhaustion, anxiety, depression, and more, mirroring some of the stories and complaints that followed the lawsuit. Some Blizzard staff referred to Activision as the Eye of Sauron. Again, it's kind of silly, but the fact that people just sort of casually had these sayings in the company just show how ingrained this type of stuff was. With budget cuts constantly looming, managers of each department have jockeyed for resources. As a result, some, of, some are reluctant to report internal problems and risk drawing unwanted attention to their teams from corporate overlords, current employees said. Activision Blizzard said it aims to preserve Blizzard's unique identity while ensuring a safe and fair work environment. It recently awarded equity to every employee, the spokesman said. Again, these are just these are just platitudes. However, a recent revision to the performance review system forces managers to give more frequent negative reviews, which will result in less generous bonuses and profit shares for Blizzard employees. Three people familiar with the change said. Several women said they fear this will give managers more opportunities to discriminate in conscious and unconscious ways, and that it will further empower the company's supposed rock stars. Okay, that's the end. Um, <clears throat> that last paragraph says a lot. It says a lot. So when it says that they they're forced to give out um, more negative reviews, so how much you're compensated is based on if if part of it is based on your performance review, um, the company says well because we can only afford to give a certain number of people the benefits of a five star review like if it's like a zero to five scale you know it's a simplification but um, that that means that we have to give more negative reviews like literally not everybody can get a five. Um, because we can't afford to give everybody the the financial reward of getting a five on their performance reviews. Um, again, this is an oversimplification. It's there's a lot more detail that I could go into, but I'm familiar with this type of performance reviewing, and it's always there's always a lot of rumors surrounding it. Um, <clears throat> but the second part of the paragraph also really plays into it, which is about um, discriminating in conscious and unconscious ways. Um, going to BlizzCon and trying to pick up like groupie fans or like calling your fans groupies for example just because they wanted to dress up as a character is a conscious form of discrimination and it's gross um but unconscious ways of discrimination are again more implicit um i'm trying to think like if if you hire four times more men than women that's likely due to unconscious implicit bias where um a lot of the times the response to um Equitable hiring, for example, is saying, well, you should always just be hiring the most qualified candidate. 
And what you're saying is you're implying that the most qualified candidate, for example, here in the gaming industry is like the white guy. Like, the, the reality is there are thousands of applicants for these positions and there are plenty of highly qualified, competitive, diverse candidates. And because of implicit bias, uh, we tend to get this weight towards, you know, four times more men than women. Um, again, that is not reflective at all in saying that the men were necessarily more qualified, right? I'm of the belief there's, I mean, it's, it's very small minded to think like, oh, well, there's one man and one woman who applied for this job and we can't let the woman get it because she's less qualified just because we need, just because we need a, a, di a diverse hire. It's not like that. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of employees for these roles, right? There's, there's no way there isn't a qualified set subset of of someone from like every demographic you can think of um so again there is that existing implicit bias so again the way that this last paragraph sort of frames it is if there's something institutionalized such as the way these performance reviews have have worked is you're giving an opportunity to people to apply implicit biases that continue to work against the women at the company uh in even worse ways like constantly uh Man, it's just, this is a lot. Um, my main takeaway is, look, you can't care about literally every problem in the world, but this is one that is close to me because I play these products a lot. Um, I like to think, I sort of rationalize in, in the sense that I've already paid for these games and I don't think that what I'm doing is, you know, sending any sort of meaningful revenue to, to ActiBlizz and that I'm also highlighting what the community is making which is being made in spite of the original developers. Um, my other takeaway is I think it's important to push back against this whole idea that like, oh, it's all about Activision and how it ruined Blizzard. I mean, yeah, they, it, they clearly ruined morale and instituted crunch, which made existing problems worse. But I think a, a lot of the harassment issues existed well before um, Activision started micromanaging and tinkering within Blizzard. Um, third point is a lot of this stuff it, it has to do with leadership. And you can see how the one top-level employee who was known for making inappropriate comments, uh, his entire organization was the one where the, a lot of these complaints were centered. And that's because leadership is incredibly important and a lot of this cultural stuff comes from the top down. Again, it's not just about putting in your handbook to check some sort of regulatory um, checkbox, right? It's about actually following through and doing this stuff. And I think the extremely sad part is that this whole thing with Blizzard is just a sad, tiny window into how this subset of technology uh, functions as an industry. And I just hope that we get some definitive and very clear changes uh, at Blizzard, and I hope other companies also are a little more public and transparent with their hiring practices, with their corporate culture, um, so that we know that some changes are happening, because this is just, it's unacceptable.